Okay, we are now recording. Great, thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks, Stephanie. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, happy Friday. Uh, and uh, this is this, the uh, Town of Amherst Solar Bylaw Working Group meeting for Friday, December 2nd. Um, and um, thanks, everybody, for being here. We do have a quorum so we can get started. Um, um, thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, Chris, for being here as our um, uh, staff people. And uh, Jonathan Murray, we'll get to you later from KP Law. Thanks for joining us today as well. Um, everybody has the agenda. Um, and I guess maybe just uh, we'll, we'll work on, we'll complete the minutes, obviously, and then we'll have, um, uh, and let me just ask Stephanie in terms of uh, making the most valuable use of, of Jonathan's time of whether we should um, move that agenda, his agenda topic up at the beginning so he can be, um, um, uh, use his time efficiently or, or um, should we go through the staff updates and the committee updates first? I would move us later and yeah. move Jonathan up and, exactly. and, and even the minutes. I mean, you, you don't absolutely have to do the minutes okay. straight up. You can do that after Jonathan as well. Okay. I, I think that would make sense if that sounds good with everybody and we do have everybody here. Um, but let me, um, before the, the one thing of importance is uh, just to confirm our minute taker for today. Um, who um, per my notes is uh, Martha. <laughs> a great yeah um from uh uh she wasn't available to do it last time so she's on board now <clears throat> so thank you uh martha uh and then um maybe i'll email uh janet to let her know that she's uh she's on deck for the next meeting um okay great um all right so um um, as as um, we recall from a number of meetings ago, uh, we had the opportunity to uh, engage with uh, the town um, general counsel, um, KP Law, uh, and provided some um, questions uh, pertaining to our the mission in front of us um, with regard to drafting solar bylaws. Uh, and we all put together, I think, uh, with along with another committee, uh, put together some questions uh, to pose to KP Law um, uh, that can help us move forward in our um, writing of these uh, draft draft regulations and reviewing them and sort of understanding the um, uh, the guardrails around the the, the legal frameworks here. Uh, and so, really appreciate. Uh, the town offering the services of the general counsel and the uh, and KP Law and Jonathan Murray particularly for taking this on um, and providing to us uh, responses to uh, both the presentation uh, and responses specific response some general comments and then specific responses to our questions so um, that is in our packet. Um, and um, <clears throat> why don't I, uh, Stephanie, can I hand it to you to maybe do a more formal introduction uh, to Jonathan as our, as the town council, town general council? Um, sure. I, I don't know how much more formal <laughs> I, or, can, or whatever. I can make it, but I mean, maybe <laughs> Jonathan, you would just like to introduce yourself. Okay. Uh, sure. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jonathan Murray. I'm an attorney at KP Law. Um, my practice is mostly land use, zoning enforcement, um, adoption of zoning and planning board requirements and regulations, that sort of stuff. So um, what we've seen over the past three or four years is uh, uh, an increased interest in solar bylaws and uh, associated battery energy storage bylaws. Uh, so uh, you provided some some great questions. I think there was 16 or 17 of them. I hope I, I answered them to your satisfaction, but I'm happy to go in more depth, or if you have new questions, really, whatever is the best use of your all time, I'm happy to try to uh, be of assistance. Great. D did people have time to um, sort of take a look at the, uh, re recall yeah. the questions that we asked and, and take a look at the responses? Yeah, I, I think it'd be great, Dwayne, if we could just walk through even at a high level, if that's, if we have time for that, I don't know if we have time. 
I, 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 this is very important in my mind, uh, so um, I wouldn't mind doing that. Um, and uh, I do encourage everybody. I don't think we need to spend the yeah. Yeah. We'll probably take half an hour to go through the presentation, but I very much encourage people to look through the presentation that was offered, not to mention if you have the wherewithal to go back to the recording of Jonathan's presentation of, uh, uh, of this presentation to uh what was it the planning committee um, zoning board of appeals sorry so, yeah the zba the zoning board of appeal um a few weeks ago um so great uh so yeah can we um stephanie do you want to mm -hmm. pull sure. the um question the questions and, and jonathan's responses to those um on the screen Awesome. Can everybody I, see those? Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, and Jonathan, maybe um, you know, not not the forty-five minute version, but maybe the, the three or four minute version of, of some of sort of these um, um, sort of background issues and sort of frameworks of uh, of the um, of the uh, rules that were sort of that, that sort of drive the limitations and opportunities that we have with regard to zoning around solar. Yeah, absolutely. So um, as you all might know, zoning in Massachusetts is governed um, primarily by General Law Chapter 40A. It's the Zoning Act. Um, and Section 3 of the Zoning Act, um, it's it's often referred to as the Dover Amendment. You'll see that a lot. Um, it, if we're being pedantic, it, it's not all uh, the Dover Amendment. It's just one paragraph. But you'll hear you'll hear that phrase a lot. So it's I think it's important just to to flag it for you, the Dover Amendment. But uh, the purpose of Section 3 is a uh, limitation on the powers of a municipality as it pertains to zoning. And so uh, the legislature has enumerated a list of particular uses which a town is either prohibited from regulating through zoning or is limited. Uh, that, that includes religious uses, educational uses, agricultural uses, um, radio antenna towers, um, uh, child care, uh, but obviously the one we're talking about today is solar. Uh, and I've, I've cited the, the statutory language, but just to put it, uh, to paraphrase it, and if you have the opportunity to, to see my presentation of the ZBA, you'll see I repeat this ad nauseum. I'm a broken record about it. Uh, but the a municipality, when it's looking to regulate solar uses, um, it cannot unreasonably uh, regulate the use. Um, and its regulations must be connected to public health, safety, and welfare. Uh, so that phrase is really important. Um, that's what the courts are going to look at if a bylaw is ever challenged. That's what, um, you know, for other communities, that's what the attorney general looks at uh, in her review. Um, so when the, the, the guardrails, if you will, are regulations can't be unreasonable, and they have to have some connection to public health, safety, and welfare. Uh, so that's so that's kind of your foundation you should you should have in the back of your head when we're talking about solar bylaws. Um, just to go just a little high high level uh, about this, but um, I know there was a question in here about what is public health, safety, and welfare, um, and I wish I could give you this de uh, dictionary definition of what that means. But unfortunately, the courts and the attorney generals have kind of put that. Uh, the onus back on on the community to say what is a public health safety and welfare concern for the town and so you'll see as i answer your questions i put emphasis on um your group and and other boards in the town really making an effort to study uh document and and put in purpose you know your purpose section what are those connections to public health safety and welfare because uh in my opinion the more explicit we can be with a bylaw about you know the reasons why we're regulating solar uses and how it's going to protect the community the more likely it's going to survive a challenge in court um and then i'll just touch uh, briefly on battery energy storage uses um section three that dover amendment doesn't specifically call out battery storage units so it's not on that list of uh uses that the zoning act limits or prohibits a town from regulating. With that said, courts and the attorney general 
have interpreted section three to include battery energy when it's associated with solar. So what we see often is large ground mounted solar installations, um, and then they, you know, they collect the energy and they put it in batteries on site. Quartz and the AG have said when it's associated on the same parcel or, you know, associated on the same site with solar, that battery is entitled to the same protections. Now, if you were to have a, it, the case law isn't fully developed and we're not particularly sure, but as it stands right now, uh, independent standalone battery energy storage systems, if you were just to have a battery somehow in the field, that's not entitled to Zoning Act protection, uh, as, uh, at least as we know right now, but most certainly if it's connected to a use and if it's included in a solar bylaw, definitely, um, the town has to be aware that it might be limited uh, in how it regulates those uses. So um, that's kind of a high level guardrails of what the Zoning Act says and, and the, the factors that a town needs to consider when adopting a bylaw. Um, and then, um, you know, I'm happy to go into particulars um, or if there's any questions about that. Great. Um, maybe Laura can um, uh, um, check me on this, but to the extent that, um, at least for larger scale solar projects, which is what we're sort of primarily focused on here, um, I believe the SMART program requires some degree of energy storage. Um, is that not true, Laura? But if if, if it is true, um, or at least they get an incentive for storage. And I thought there was some requirement mm -hmm. that some amount of storage was there. Uh, but um, uh, no to the extent- No storage is required, but I think it's certainly the norm that you're seeing it right now. Dwayne. Okay, okay. Uh, so you're saying, Jonathan, that in, in that case, even if it's not required, uh, if it is associated with the solar project, it would be considered um, under that same Dover protection, I guess, of of, uh, of the solar installation. I, I have a question. So, Jonathan, yeah. for standalone storage, um, is there any expectation that that will, you know, eventually fall under sort of the zoning protections that you discuss, or is it is it just sort of unknown at this point? It's sort of unknown. The way that the, the paragraph in Section 3 is drafted, it says the collection of solar energy. Um, uh, I'll say the word exactly so I don't mess it up here. It's, um, it is the collection of solar energy. And so I, I haven't seen this yet, but I suspect someone in the future is going to make up the argument well, batteries are required to collect solar energy because where else are we going to put them? I, I, we haven't even seen that yet, but that's kind of my fear or at least my concern. So as of right now, what the courts have been saying is if you adopt a bylaw uh, and regulate battery storage uses in association with solar, uh, you can't parse that out. You know, once once you associate it with solar, everything has the protection. Um, some communities have adopted standalone battery storage bylaws. Those have been been approved by the attorney general um, as not unreasonable and not, uh, in most cases, not protected by Section 3. Um, but that's kind of where we're at right now is we don't know for certain, but if it's not associated with solar, there seems to be a more liberal um, view of it in regards to the Section 3 protection. Great, thank you. Um, any other general questions for Jonathan before we move on to looking at some of the, his responses to our specific questions? Super, okay. Um, so maybe we can um, scroll, I think the other way, well, I'm not sure, uh, just to where he starts answering the questions. Um, yeah, keep going. Okay, and maybe we can go through these uh, relatively quickly, Jonathan, and, and see if there's any further sort of follow up from an, anybody. I think these first two, actually, first two questions probably could be handled together with regard to uh, sort of uh, potential constraints on on the uh, size of arrays 
Um, and then the second one was uh, um, the, the, the size of the ray by, by sort of acreage or capacity or acreage, or, or the first one had to do with the uh, size of a solar array um, in terms of um, forested or agricultural land and clearing. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, so my responses to one and two, I, I hope, um, uh, provide an example about uh, basically draftsmanship of these types of bylaws. Um, we had two kind of different examples, but trying to get at the same policy objective. Wareham uh, attempted to adopt a bylaw that just provided a straight out lot size restriction. Whereas uh, Medway also had a restriction on um, the general size, but associated it with mitigation of lost carbon and forest habitat. And so what the attorney general said in the Wareham case was the straight out lot size restriction without any association to public health, safety, and welfare was unreasonable on its face. Um, the town did not make an attempt to connect it to those three factors. And so the without any evidence, without any rationale, and without any objectives, the attorney general said, we have no way of knowing if there's uh, if this is an appropriate regulation under section three, therefore we disapprove. Mm -hmm. um, the Medway example is, uh, and I think I linked it in a footnote, but if you go in, you can see, um, just because I know someone else in my office who who's helping them with this, uh, they spent quite a bit of time and, and hired outside experts and uh, really associated their restrictions with with the, these public health concerns, uh, prim primarily, you know, the cutting down of forests, the loss of carbon and the effect of the loss of vegetation might have on the community in general and abundant communities. And the AG said, well, that's a more reasonable um, regulation, especially with the connection to public health. So I, I think with both one and two, and, and really with a lot of these, these responses, my response has generally been, um, it may be permissible. And I know that's not always a helpful thing, but it may be permissible um, to regulate it. But what we have to do is maybe take a step back and say, well, what is the purpose of this? If we just say we want solar on um, acres that are no more than five acres, that not only not that the AG would necessarily be looking at this, but you know, if if I were to bring this to court and the judge says, well, why did the town do that? Uh, and, and if we don't have a, a particularly good reason, or if we didn't um, spell it out in the bylaw, or we don't have studies or or anything like that. Um, it most certainly is going to be declared unreasonable. But if you know we're concerned about size, we're concerned about loss of forest and vegetation and agricultural land, and we can make that association between, well, lots of these particular sizes um, allow for, you know, or, or I should say, you know, large lots like these account for X amount of forest lost, and that's a loss of this amount of carbon and that has this public health effect uh, the the likelihood of it passing scrutiny goes up uh, tremendously um that's not to say that a court might not say well you shouldn't do it anyway uh, that's always the risk with judges um but um my general point my 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 overview of one and two is it may be permissible but it's really important for this group and the town um to document the the policy reason why you're attempting to adopt this and its connection to public health safety and welfare and and so long as you document why you're attempting to adopt this policy objective or this policy rationale um, and its connection to those factors your likelihood of it um, passing scrutiny goes up super yeah okay uh great uh jack yeah, again, I'm not a, a biologist. Um, I'm a I'm a geologist, and uh, <laughs> but the trees, you know, kind of fascinate me, and and you know, I understand that you know, there's a lot of pushback with regard to uh, conversion of, of forest land to you know a solar field, but but to me, there's also this factor of of a different quality of different forest stands. Yeah. Uh, you know, certainly old growth, you know, stands out 
but is there any sort of sliding scale that you're seeing or aware of in terms of assessing uh, the you know the value of one forest versus another with regard to you know maybe the habitat there uh, of the other and beyond you know the carbon uh, you know benefits of of the forest track? We haven't you know this is this this kind of um, the case law on this is is still pretty new. So I haven't personally seen anything like that. But I would just say, and I'm I'm not a scientist or or anyone with that sort of training, so I couldn't talk with any authority on it. But you know, say for example, you know, this group or some group or or whomever was able to document, we know that based on this evidence from this group or this national group that cutting down of old forest is, is harmful to the public health in these ways. Um, and you put that in there, you, I think I think that might be a reasonable take to, to have. Um, so I think there is an opportunity for a sliding scale. It's just going to depend on, can we back it up with good evidence or, or at least a good rationale and an explanation on, you know, why is old forest more detriment or the cutting of old forest more detrimental than new growth? Or why is it, you know, you know, more detrimental than some other category that, you know, I, I apologize, I don't know, but, uh, you know, whatever it may be. Um, so to answer your question, yeah, I think there, there, there's the possibility for a sliding scale when it comes to these types of bylaws. Thanks. Um, Martha? Okay. Two, and Laura. Th yeah. two things. One, in answer to Jack's question, I think the problem is that it's difficult to quantify the benefit of a certain acreage of forest. You know, you can't take 20 acres and say, well, it's going to you know, hold X amount of CO2 or it's going to have, you know, 25 species of, of you know, protected uh, plants or animals or something. And so that's the challenge that I see uh, in, in trying to balance, when we try to balance the solar, which we can quantify how many megawatts we get, versus the contribution of the forest. And then my question is, uh, does the 2022 Massachusetts Climate Action Plan was published in June and, and kind of talks more about uh, the values of forest, does that, uh, does citing that help count as a justification for protecting public health welfare? Um yeah I, yeah I would I would say uh publications like that, that or from any other you know maybe state federal organization or you know nonprofit group or, or university or whatever it may be those are all great things to cite uh, especially in this type of bylaw um so long as the conclusion of whatever that document is backs up your your policy decision yeah I I would I would recommend citing as much as you can okay Good. L Laura? Just real quick, um, because I, I agree with um, Jack's comment about like old growth forests. Is there anything in Massachusetts that would have, let's say a landowner has a land on an old growth forest and they want to, for example, um, harvest the timber from the property? Could is there any restrictions in mass that would prevent them from doing that? Like, let's say they're not using solar. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just curious. Um, there's a few different programs that I can think of off the top of that my head that might restrict someone's ability to cut down forests. Um, there's a category of tax law called chapter lands, um, and that restricts, uh, it, it provides restrictions on agricultural forest and recreation land um, in exchange for tax breaks, but those are voluntary programs, the chapter lands. So, you know, for example, if someone had a forest and they entered into a chapter land agreement with the assessor's office, they would be restricted in that regard. Um, certainly, if the, if the forest was protected either under um, the Wetlands Protection Act or a local wetlands bylaw, if it's, you know, either uh you know within that buffer zone jurisdiction or if it's you know say perhaps like a, a national wildlife habitat or something like that you might be restricted um 
to be honest, I don't, we don't really see timbering questions that often. That's um, fine. No, I was just, I was just curious of, because I, I think that it's a logical um, restriction, um, but I would love to see in Amherst, you know, if you have a particular parcel of land on a really sensitive area, uh, you know, I'm just trying to think of bolster in that case and, you know, the counter argument from a landowner that would say, okay, fine, you're not letting me put solar here, but I could just go ahead and, you know, timber from this land, you know what I mean, like do other things. Um, so just curious, thank you. Great, and um, I guess Jonathan, just from my thoughts on this, I mean, so if if um, I mean, you you've mentioned sort of if, if you um, uh, justify restrictions on cutting uh, forests for to put up solar uh, based on ecological, uh, you say public health. I'm not sure if it's public health or general welfare, uh, but. Um, if on those measures, it, it, would that then fly if you just if you just had then just a um, complete uh, a zoning measure that just said no forest land anywhere in, ma in 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 our town can be cut down for solar? Does it have to be a little bit more specific to to the uh, to the site to the to the sites? Well, um, it, I don't know if it necessarily needs to be tailored to the site, but the regulations have to be what's called narrowly tailored. So I would think that a wholesale prohibition against cutting a forest would probably, a court would say that's not narrowly ta tailored in the sense that, you know, if your objective is to protect public health and welfare, and to do that, we're, we're going to prohibit the cutting, um, what's the, you know, what's the balancing between that protection and also letting the, the landowner make use of their property. Um, so just as a hypothetical, I think a wholesale prohibition would likely be unreasonable. So you'd have to really narrow that down to say, you know, these are the concerns, these are our specific concerns, and these are how we're gonna address them in a way that both protects the, you know, protects the interest and allows a, an owner to make use of their property. All right, great. Thank you. All right, let's let's move on. And we have uh, the next question is, is um, maybe very similar, but specifically more to um, sort of um, a, a prohibition or at least limitations with regard to um, like uh, slopes, for example. So I, I think like going back to my last response, this is something um, you might you might have to have a conversation about how do we narrowly, you know, regulate or narrowly define, or we we adopt a narrowly tailored regulation. So, if you just said no solar installations on slopes more than whatever the degree is, twenty degrees, ten degrees, whatever it is, that might be unreasonable. Now, I don't know if it is, but it might be. What what might have more success is to say, you know, on slopes of zero to five percent, these are the these are the actions you must take to mitigate the erosion risk on 10 to 20. These are the actions you have to take. Um, and so that sort of breaking it out and, and providing an opportunity for the landowner to still make use of it, but but then require mitigation me measures or protection measures, um, you're, that's a more reasonable, narrowly ta tailored regulation. Um, so again, I think I say in here, you know, what's what's the reason for the regulation on slopes. And then I think you work your way, you know, as that that's your starting point, you work your way from how do we protect that interest uh, in a way that's not a wholesale prohibition, not a wholesale um, you know, regulation, but you know, how do we address it in a in a targeted way? Hmm. Great. Uh Chris, yeah, please. So um, when we're reading other cities and towns bylaws, we see a lot of these restrictions, such as what we're talking about. For instance, Belchertown has a requirement, you know, not to cut more than X acres of, of woodland. I think it's um, 10 acres or something like that. And they have a requirement not to have a solar array larger than X amount, X size. So we can see that those are in other towns bylaws, but the reason they're there is because they haven't been challenged, right? Um, and if someone were to 
come along and challenge those, those things may actually be found to be not in keeping with um, the law. Is that correct? I'm not picking on Belchertown. I'm just trying to give examples to people who are listening and people who are on the Solar Bylaw Working Group that, you know, just because we see some other town has this regulation doesn't mean that we should also adopt it. We have to have our own specific reasons for adopting things. And we can't count on other cities and towns to have already done whatever research or, you know, in order to back up something like this. That's that's what I wanted to ask. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. And if I can just add to provide a little more context about what the case law has been up until this summer, up until July, we didn't have um, a, a real a, a clear appellate case interpreting Section 3. Uh, and I talk about it in the memo, but the case is called Tracer Lane, and we finally got it this summer. It was a Supreme, a state Supreme Judicial Court case, um, and it's not particularly about slopes or anything, but it was interpreting the uh, the permissible scope of regulations that a municipality can adopt. And so, what you'll see is, you know, other communities who may have adopted solar bylaws in the past three, four years, the Attorney General's opinion might say. We approve this, but be aware of this requirement, not with the knowledge that the SJC just gave us in July. So it's going to be really interesting to see because folks had fall town meeting and the AG hasn't completed their review of those bylaws, but most certainly most towns have their annual town meeting in the spring. We're going to see a lot of zoning bylaws there. And we're going to, we're going to have to see, you know, how is the attorney general um, interpreting this in light of this brand new court case? Um, so that's just something to consider you know, to Chris's point, towns may have adopted these regulations or bylaws um, in the past, but they might not pass scrutiny today in light of Tracer Lane. Uh, so just something to be aware of. Great, thank you. Martha? Okay, two, two things. One in re response to, to Chris, I mean, I, I agree with her uh, comments, but I would also you know, picture the case where if every town except one had a bylaw, let us say, limiting the size of an array to 15 acres. Uh, and so then the uh, developer might say, aha, here's this one town that we can go to and put up a large array. <laughs> Whereas if every town has that uh, restriction, then the developer, yeah, they could still, you know, file a, a, a legal uh process or something, but it seems to me, it, just tossing this out, it might be a protection if the other communities are doing it too, then maybe, you know, it's, it's okay if, 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 if we do something similar, if we can justify it. And the other question is, I was just a little surprised uh, about saying that one doesn't really need a, a any slope requirement. Um, I mean, we've had conversations about that. And Jack, I think maybe my question would go to you. It seemed we've had discussions about the detriments of, of uh, steep slopes. And then if you try to grade it, you're, you know, you're taking away and really disturbing the soil to some depth, et cetera, with the erosion. So I just wondered about that. And maybe Jack has the answer. I agree. Do you, do you have a, a response to that, Jack? I know you have your hands hand up otherwise. <laughs> Oh, uh, with the slope, I mean, I, I you know, for me, um, you know, anything can be engineered, uh, similar to, to what Jonathan was saying that, you know, you, you just have to put in appropriate mitigation measures, which would be an increased cost uh, to the developer. Uh, for me, the slope, you know, probably falls more like more in the view shed, creeping into it more the view shed aspects, uh, you know, versus, you know, erosion, erosion, because, um you know, I think anything can be engineered. Um, so, yeah, I, I for me, the, the slope restriction probably isn't, wouldn't be a high priority for us, you know, to include within the bylaw. But <laughs> with with a caveat that at different, as Jonathan sort of laid out, different slopes may require different levels yes. of of, uh, uh, of um, design or, or or safety. Correct. Yes. <laughs> Agree. All right. I knew you had your hand up. I think otherwise, yeah, Jack. Yeah, I was just wondering if if uh, Jonathan uh, again Tracer Lane. I've seen it, uh, and it's <laughs> it's not permeated my 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 brain yet. 
But I'm wondering if you could just like some takeaways again, just so I can jot down this because it, it it has come up. Uh, I know an, another member of our uh, work group, uh, Janet McGowan, has brought it up, and I just wondered what if there's a few bullets for us to, uh, you know, to understand and and carry forward from that. Um, yeah, absolutely. So the the 20 second background of what tracer lean was was um the developer was looking to build a, a solar installation in the neighboring town of lexington and they needed an access road which happened to be in waltham and waltham has an ordinance that prohibited uh, solar in all but two percent of their town um, and the court made a few different findings the first was this wholesale prohibition from 98% of the town was unreasonable. So one takeaway is when we're talking about zones in which solar may be permitted, um, the, the current trade winds are that this wholesale prohibition from zoning districts is likely unreasonable. Um, so a lot of towns might have bylaws restricting them from all residential. Um, we haven't seen a case yet, but I suspect we're going to see a case saying um, that's not permissible under Section 3. So that's the first one. The second, the second takeaway from Tracer Lane is the treatment of accessory structures. So like I said, the solar installation in Tracer Lane was, at, was not actually in the city of Waltham. It was in the, the neighboring community. Um, what was in Waltham was the access road. You know, the, the only way they could get access to the site was through the so Waltham. And the court said, even the access road, which is accessory to the, to the underlying use, um, is entitled to that protection. And so that's why we've kind of developed this thought about battery storage is to say, if an access road has this protection, most certainly we think a battery, which collects the energy that's produced on the site, is also going to be entitled to that protection. Um, now, that's not to say that all uses on the site are, are entitled to protection. We might say, you know, temporary construction trailers or, um, you know, uh, fencing or, or, or stuff like that. You know, that might, those aren't necessarily, you know, you could imagine scenarios where those aren't entitled to protection or, 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 or at least subject to regulations. But I think the second takeaway from Trace Lane is uh, accessory structures or accessory uses which support the collection of solar energy um, or, or ground mounted solar are also entitled to zoning uh, protection. Um, those are the two main takeaways from Tracer Lane. I think the, the practical impact of Tracer Lane, what we've seen is the attorney general has taken a hard line stance to say, uh, municipalities are severely limited and, and how much they can regulate solar. What we've also seen, this was just out of the land court, so it's not binding, but it's, I guess, an indication of where the courts are going. It was a land court case out of Walpole, and Walpole had um, a bylaw similar to Waltham that prohibited um, more than 98% of their land area prohibited solar. And the land court said, based on Tracer Lane, we find that to be facially unreasonable, and we strike down the bylaw. Um, so that's kind of just an indication, a practical effect of what Tracer Lane has said. But I would say Tracer Lane in general, maybe the three points are, again, public health, safety, and welfare. These regulations can't be unreasonable, and you have to have that connection. Um, accessory uses and structures are entitled to that protection, uh, and wholesale prohibitions of these use are facially unreasonable. Thank you. All right, good. This is really helpful, Jonathan. Thank you. Um, let's move on. Um, the, the, the next, I'm not sure if we need too much. The next question seems pretty straightforward to me, I guess, with regard to um, potentially requiring um, a third party um, or re requiring that the developer cover the cost of a third party to um, provide inspection oversight uh inspections of a of a particularly uh, of a project particularly i think during the construction period to assure they're upholding 
the um, the, the the regulations and, and zoning uh, requirements. Um, any thought? Any summary of that or with? Yeah, I just very quickly. Um, you know, boards have the ability to hire outside consultants under uh, forty four uh, section fifty three G. Um, many many boards, many communities do this as a regular practice. Um, when the boards, it, you know, if you put in that ability in the bylaw, um, many board the the statute requires the boards to adopt regulations, um, you know, on how they hire. Um, so that's more of I think a conversation for either the planning board or the ZBA or or whoever might be taking up this. Um, you know, these types of things. What I would say to, uh, to the point about narrowly tailoring, um, certainly during construction and inspections, I think, you know, this might be a decision more for the, the permit granting authority or the, or the board that's overseeing it, but just something to keep in mind about the reasonableness of regulations and how we narrowly tailor things. You know, certainly if we said, you know, during construction, we want you to do monthly inspections or you know inspections at these points in, in the development stage for safety reasons or fire risk reasons or um you know certainly the building commissioner is going to go out there and make sure it's up to building code what might be unreasonable is to say you know you you need to hire uh, someone to go out and inspect you know every month for the life of the site certainly that you know it would be hard to justify why they need to pay for that um, a narrowly tailored version of that might be once a year you shall submit to the town a um, you know a, a letter stating who's who's in charge of the maintenance of the property and an emergency contact number and and, and things like that so that if there was an emergency you'd have proper information so I, I think just another point of when we're talking when we're thinking about regulations and we're thinking about um, you know provisions we think about you know how can we how can we get to the end goal without overly burdening an applicant um, mm-hmm. or overly burdening the process? Um, um, yeah, I, I guess that's my yeah. point on that one. So, yeah, so just really yeah, Laura, yeah, go ahead. Wayne, um, it is totally reasonable. I've seen it done. It's just if you if we wanted to bake in some kind of like um, you know. Uh, you know, O and M requirement because solar for the most part doesn't require a tremendous amount of, of operations and maintenance. But I've seen it done in the past where you know it's just a matter of cost. If we wanted to pay and have the project pay for a third party consultant to tack on to the ongoing O and M on a you know you know twice annual basis or annual basis. Um, you know, for the purposes of going back to like health and safety, um, I think that would be something that we could definitely do uh, that the commission or this working group should consider. Yeah. All right, good. Um, I think the next question may be, uh, I, I know there's no <laughs> clear answer on, on the definition of public uh, welfare, but maybe we can uh, sort of, um, Get your views on that a bit more, Jonathan. Um, um, with regard to, um, and, and you mainly couched it so far more as public health. Um, is there a differentiation uh, with that and public welfare? Are they kind of seem to overlap each other? But are there some things that are might not be like aesthetics that might not be covered under health, but more welfare? Um, and then also, I'm just also wondering from my perspective. In terms of public welfare, you know, this whole desire to move to renewable energy is all about public welfare too, <laughs> uh, with regard to um, addressing our climate emergency. Um, and so, how 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 are those counter? I mean, th- this is why it's so hard because there's counteracting uh, public welfare is at stake here. Um, and so, how how would you imagine sort of threading that, and how the courts would look at that? Yeah. So to your first point, uh, and, and as I, I indicate in my response, there's no there's no um, formalized definition of these things. Um, I I think from a from a starting point, I I would recommend just the common sense approach. You know, is is the proposed policy uh, position does it make does it make sense? Is it related to public health? Is it related to safety? Is it related to welfare? Uh, and then we get into the you know what evidence are we using to to justify that. 
I, I would also say these are, are pretty local um, interpretations. So if a, a judge is looking at this, if, uh, you know, if, if the judge in Northampton or the judge in Boston is looking at this and, and, and says, it, it, they're not going to look at Belchertown. They're not going to look at Hadley. They're not going to look at uh, Deerfield. They're going to look at, well, what did Amherst say? What did, what did Amherst concerns for their public health and safety and welfare? Um, so I think that's also something to keep in consideration. Certainly you can, you know, there's going to be a lot of overlapping concerns between neighboring towns and you might have some of the same concerns, but I would just say from how, how a judge would treat it, the judge isn't going to compare necessarily compare this to other parts of the state. Um, it's going to be based on the words you put it in the paper and the rationale behind it. Um, and then I think the last point was about these, these competing interests, or at least you know, this might get into more political positions or philosophical positions about, you know, what is, what is public welfare and, you know, what do you do when, when there are, you know, two camps or more than two camps that they take different positions on this. Um, I think in those scenarios, I mean, th these are policy decisions, which I hesitate to advise on, but just from a, from a drafting perspective, um, you know, again, this, this goes back to evidence and this goes back to uh, citing. So I, I think Martha had cited, you know, the, the energy publication that was just put out by the state. Certainly that's good evidence to put out when we talk about, you know, you know, public welfare. And, and if you can cite to different sources, um, it, it's, it's hard, it's hard to, it's hard to answer that one um, with any authority, but I, I guess that would be my recommendation. Great. Thank you. Yeah, Jack. Yeah, I just would want to note uh, during uh, Jonathan's presentation to the ZBA, one of the ZBA members is also similar to Laura, kind of active uh, in the industry. And he just mentioned that, you know, the battery storage facilities, uh, you know, the recent ones that uh, they have installed, that they, the noise factor is is fairly minimal. Not that we wouldn't want to address noise in the bylaw, but that the bat, you know, the the thing with the battery uh, energy uh, storage systems ha having a noise factor is is probably going to be a moot issue. Great, that was evidence at the uh, landfill project too, um, with the uh, battery system that's installed there. Um, I actually went by it, and it was seemed to be on, but it was just a minimal hum. Okay, great. Anything else? Questions on uh, for Jonathan on on these issues so far? Great. Okay, then. Um, Dwayne, I'm sorry. Can I jump in real quick? Yeah, please, Stephanie. Um, because I'm just thinking about citing existing studies, but wondering about more if it's so locally focused. Then, you know, what about hiring? an independent consultant to come in and sort of investigate our condi existing conditions, citing those studies, but looking specifically at the town, like uh, are there other examples of communities doing such a study? Um, I'm, so in the footnote, I think on, I think footnote two or three, uh, if you look at Medways, they, they hired some outside, they, I think they hired two outside consultants. Um, I would say, it's not a requirement to do that. Um, certainly, certainly, you can adopt these bylaws and regulations without it, um, and and you can maybe recreate the result. You know, either like either this working group goes out and has public meeting sessions and hears from the community, or sends out a survey, or you know, there's there's more cost effective ways maybe to get to the same result. Um, but certainly, if if there was an independent review and and the and the consultant said, uh, you know, for Amherst specifically, these are the public health concerns. We have these water sources and these old forest growths and these, you know, if you can cite to those, that's great. I mean, that you would you would be you would be at the top of the list at the most thorough bylaws in the Commonwealth, I think. Um, but I, I again, I don't think it's I don't think it's required. I don't think the majority of communities aren't doing that. Um, and, there, there's probably more cost-effective ways to get to that same result, but it it would it would be a benefit, most certainly. Great. 
Okay. Um, yep, Martha. Yeah, just in uh, reply to, to Stephanie, I mean, we already have two consultants. We have your consultant and then the one Chris is, is, uh, said they will be hiring. So doesn't that cover things? If I can respond to that, Dwayne. Yeah, please. Um, well, I'm specifically yeah. looking at the question of public safe, uh, health safe, safety and welfare, and they're not looking at that specifically. They're just doing a general investigation and asking about community priorities. But that's, in my mind, these are still a little bit different. When you're talking about citing specific impacts to slope, that's a very specific, different um, question than just the sort of you know, general survey, um, our, our consultant is not getting into that level of detail. Well, I should think that just, you know, all the information that we're assembling as a, as a, as a bylaw working group and the varied expertise we have here um, ought to really take care of that along with common sense and um, I was just asking the general question. Yes, I, that, I, I wasn't implying that this group didn't have that expertise or our resources. I'm just wondering if other communities have done that. That's all. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. I think a lot of these are going to be good discussions later on when we get to these sections of the of the bylaw uh, for us to all work out either through common sense or through um, digging in and, and uh, researching a bit more, uh, or potentially uh, seeing if we need need some outside consulting support. Um, okay, um, then we had some uh, uh, questions, a question here about uh, setbacks um, and, and um, um, uh, and, um, and minimum setback. So, yeah. Yeah, six and seven. I think I can I can give Go together. the same response. Yeah. It, it, yes, that that is permissible. Um, you you can have different setbacks. You can have mitigation mem uh, requirements for certain um, um, elements of a of a project design. But again, we get back to that narrowly tailored and, and connection to public health, safety, and welfare. So, if if you said you know you need a five hundred foot side side yard setback you know, you might get an appeal to the court and the judge is going to say, you know, attorney Murray, why does the town need 500 feet? Um, you know, why does it need a thousand feet? Why couldn't it have 100 feet or 200 feet? Um, and so if you go back to that Wareham example from, from an earlier response, that was kind of just a, a blanket size restriction. They didn't really explain what they were getting at. But if you said we would like, a, and these are just made up numbers, but if we need a 200 foot side yard setback because we're also going to require some vegetation replanting and we want to make sure you know the industry says that that these systems should be 50 feet away from residences and whatever the reason is you know you put that in there that's fine um but so the response to six and seven is yes that that is permissible but we should just be aware you know the reasonableness of of what you're trying to get at um uh, a thousand foot setback is not going to fly with any court, but you know, a 200 foot might or a 300 foot might or whatever, you know, whatever you can justify that that's more likely to succeed. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then to just kind of the last conversation we had about experts and all that kind of stuff, we say, you know, mitigation for, for adverse environmental impacts, erosion, that kind of stuff, uh, pollution of water supply and going back to, you know, this group and, and, other, you know, staff and boards and things like that, you know, relying on what's local. So you might say, and then again, this is made up um, just by, by way of example, say, say the conservation staff or the conservation commission said, you know, we have a problem in South Amherst with erosion because of these factors. You might want to, as a policy decision, you know, specifically call that out in your solar bylaw saying, you know, solar is still allowed, but in these particular areas, because there's a risk to public welfare based on erosion and pollution of water supply and all this stuff, here are your added mitigation requirements. And so those are instances where you can, in making these policy decisions, either rely on outside consultants or rely on uh, town staff or other boards who have that subject matter expertise that you can then loop into this bylaw to say, you know, we understand that solar is a protected use, that it's it's permissible in the town, but we're concerned about these factors, and this is how we're going to narrowly tailor our regulation. Um, 
to address those factors based on our local needs here. Um, so just to kind of tie in the last two conversations. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so let's, uh, the which number are we on now, eight? eight. Yeah. Um, I, I think I've said it about a hundred times, so I apologize. <laughs> but yeah, it, basically what I've been saying is, yeah, that, it, that's my biggest takeaway. My my biggest recommend, recommendation I give to, to towns is public health, safety, and welfare, and why. You know, what's your evidence? What's your rationale? Uh, what's your... Uh, how how are we justifying this this exercise of municipal power? Um, I leave it to you all to do the policy de decision making. But from my perspective, if it were ever to go to court, I have to say, you know, this is the evidence that the town used uh, when adopting it. Um, so that's that's an important consideration when you're adopting this. Is to say, or you know, it would be helpful to me personally. <laughs> um, <laughs> Is is to say, you know, if this was ever in front of a judge, and the judge says, "Well, why, why? I don't know why the town did this," uh, you know, giving that town, uh, giving the judge or the court that perspective in the bylaw, while it's not required for every line, you know, it is is helpful to defend. Mm -hmm. Great, um, yeah, Chris, please. So, um, when we've had discussions with our um, site assessment consultant, they've mentioned certain industry standards and they use these industry standards to decide which areas of town would be more suitable for um, solar arrays to be built. And they mentioned some, you know, slopes that, well, usually companies don't want to go beyond this slope because it's too expensive for them to cope with the uh, issues that might arise. Is it reasonable to cite those kinds of um, standards that the industry itself um, kind of puts on itself or is that not reasonable? It is reasonable. Um, I would just caveat by saying, you know, you had, you had just said, you know, the industry tends to not want to do, you know, steep slopes because of the cost i would just warn folks don't you know there's going to be some rogue applicant out there on one instance who says i'm going to put it on a 50 degree slope um i you know to heck with the industry standard so so yes it is most certainly reasonable to cite that but just keep it in the back of your head you know especially with those really extreme cases you might want to as a policy decision address those knowing that they might not come up often, but when they do, it might be contentious. And let me let me um, maybe follow up that, and it relates to the slope issue again, but we did have some, um, I think some comments that came in uh, to the Water Protection Supply Committee uh, with Jack, I, I think they were, that, um, that obviously as Jack says, you can engineer these things uh, to, to, to develop, um, uh, ability to to construct on slopes uh, and, and protect for erosion, um, but the risk goes up. And, and th th this person was really talking about sort of risk, which is a little bit more nebulous to sort of quantify. Uh, there, there are methodologies, um, and so is there a certain point where you can you might be able to say, okay, well, uh, while you know you could engineer around this, the the risks the risk of a of, of potential failure tend to go up and we're going to call it call a limit at, at some some slope angle um yeah I, I think we'd have to see what that language is but i yeah, I, I think that would be fine if we said and, and you know whatever you know maybe the expert says or the industry standards say or if if the industry standard says you know slopes greater than 50 percent fail you know the project fails 90 percent of the time or or it results in this amount of water pollution um, you could say, you know, as a public health, safety and welfare reason, we're not going, we're going to limit that. Um, yeah, I think that's reasonable. Again, a lot of, a lot of hypotheticals at this point. I think when you guys get into the specifics of the policy, we might have a different conversation about it. But as a general matter, uh, yeah, if, if there's something so extreme that it poses 
a high likelihood of failure or risk to public health, then yeah, I, I think you can address it. All right, good, thank you. All right, then um, the next question has to do with sort of um, um, rules with that may may be considered in, in sort of the zoning bylaw that sort of encourages developers to um, provide as much economic uh, economic impact economic development and benefits to the to the host community or uh, to the town um, I do get your point uh, that this can't really necessarily be a requirement uh, but could be more of an encouragement um, can you just maybe summarize your comments there yeah I think it's a really good question from from my perspective as I think about this from a litigation point of view or or defending this you know uh, I, I I balked at the question, not to say it's a bad question, but I balked at it thinking, oh no, you know, we're, we're requiring financial, you know, exact, you know, we're, we're requiring additional financials from, from parties or, or to give up ownership or, or things like that really extreme. Um, and again, it's not to say that you can't suggest that to applicants, but I think we're, where these ex extreme uh, requirements, especially relating to finances and ownership of property and anything like that, it, it, it would be, I hate to say almost impossible, but I, I'm going to use that phrase to defend that. Mm -hmm. um, it's just so hard. It would be just so hard to to rationalize or justify why, you know, we would require someone to offer up their property for sale, or we would offer, you know, require them to, to do additional you know, have additional financial burden other as compared to other uses or other similar uses in town. So, you know, I, I cited a pilot, you know, the, the tax statute chapter 59 provides for pilot agreements for certain solar installations. Certainly you could say, you know, this is, uh, the town is in favor of these types of agreements and, you know, encourages the applicant to look into that. Um, or if there's some other sort of, um, you scheme, not scheme, but you know, system or or policy idea that goes to this this subject matter. You certainly could say, you know, it's an important policy of the town to do X, Y, Z, and the applicant is is it is recommended the applicant consider this, and and certainly boards can bring it bring it up. But having wholesale requirements, um, especially re relating to ownership and financial issues, um, um, is is risky yeah yeah um i guess um let me um ask two follow-up questions one is in the in the case where the town really has the site control uh and a couple of these are um already done but like the landfill and, and i think hickory ridge probably um and i'm not sure if this is uh, per, uh um zoning or, or not uh, but um um would it would a town be able to, if they're if they have site control and they're going out and trying to get competitive bids from uh from developers um could they include in their rfp and as an evaluation criteria the extent to which there are um the quantified economic benefits that accrue to the town yeah i, I don't know if it if that goes to zoning but i would just yeah. say in general you know consensual and voluntary agreements between towns and, and developers are generally permissible. And if that's uh, one factor which folks want to come to it a, a mutual agreement on, it's generally permissible. But there's a lot of specifics there and a lot of different areas of municipal finance that it's hard to give a, a, a straight answer without knowing specifics. All right, good. And also in, in the, in the um... In in a more usual case where the, not a state control, but the town is is uh, involved, even if it's on private property, there could be still a pilot payment, right, to the town. Um, and so, in in that case, towns are always sort of in a um, negotiating disadvantage <laughs> of not really understanding very well the the uh, uh, the the, the costs and 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 cash flows associated with the solar projects, so not really knowing. Uh, having really good any information with regard to what the solar project could afford as a pilot payment. 
Um, and is there any, um, uh, would there be a strict sort of prohibition of, of uh, some financial disclosures that the town could require uh, to find out, uh, to be a little bit more um, uh, familiar and, and uh, able to understand what the pilot, how the, how the developer uh, came up with the pilot offer that they provided? To be candid, I don't know that off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, okay. So I would have to look at that, but I'll make a note and maybe I can follow up by email just to, you know, add to that point, whether this particular pilot program allows for something along that lines. Okay. I appreciate that. I think that's actually something that um, many other towns are interested in as well. All right. Um, okay. So, uh, so Chris and then Laura. I just wanted to note that there are other ways of dealing with some of these okay. things besides zoning. For instance, um, the town of Amherst has a tax incentive that it offers to developers of affordable housing, but that is something that's completely outside the realm of zoning and the town manager and the finance director negotiate with developers to agree to something like that. And that's true of pilots as well. And then there's also the host community agreement that um, marijuana purveyors need to sign with the town, but that's again, outside of zoning. So there may be things that we could put in place that wouldn't have to do with zoning and the regulatory process that could benefit the town. But again, that would be outside of zoning. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah, Laura, please. I just am curious um, because I, I think I've seen it in other communities, not necessarily in Massachusetts, where I'm wondering if this is a difference in Mass, but is it reasonable for us to say that um, that we would give preference or some sort of legal language to solar farms that offer a clear economic benefit to the town of Amherst? I I doubt it. And the reason I doubt it is because um, there's a uniformity requirement in the Zoning Act um, requires towns to treat applicants and uses uniform across districts. And mm -hmm. so I, I would think that um, and also from from just a uh, from a due process standpoint, that might be a, that's kind of a concern of mine saying, you know, we're going to treat this category of applicants different than we do that. Now, that's not to say that applicants aren't different. They offer different, you know, scopes of projects and more sophistication and all that kind of things. Um, but I think where uh, where the category is based off of benefit, economic benefits of the town, I would be I would be hesitant to say that that's, you know, I would have a concern about it. So, uh, so, so a follow-up question to that. So I understand that that's a concern if you have a private landowner that's developing solar and they've selected their developer and it's paid. Mm -hmm. But if, for example, the town of Amherst owned land and we had a bid out an RFP selecting a, you know, a developer and an asset owner um, for our parcel of land, knowing full well that the town is looking for ways to boost their tax base, that would be permissible, correct? Like as part of the bid evaluation, we're looking for deals that further help sort of bolster the you know tax foundation of the community. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think that question goes more. It doesn't really go to zoning. It doesn't go to the regulation of the underlying okay. use. It goes to Understood. the contractual relationship between the town and you know, whoever wants to use the town's land. So I think oh. it's a little two different schemes. Got it. Okay. Super. All right, good. All right, so yeah, I, I imagine we might have a have a supplementary uh, paper that we um, offer some recommendations to other groups and committees and and departments uh, that they might consider um, separate from zoning on, on these issues. Um, okay, um, getting down to the um, towards the end of the the ones pertaining to, uh, to solar. Um, uh, so we, yeah, we did have this question here with regard to, um, you know, uh, requiring, I think you like the, the language here within limitations um, of um, uh, for, for uh, developers to design their programs to, to assure that there was some degree of, of uh, 
um, wildlife habitat, maintaining wildlife habitat, pollinator habitat. Um, I would throw in that as well that there is, uh, you know, there, there, the state does, you know, it may not be permanent, but the state does currently have in their program an adder specifically for pollinator, pollinator and friendly, wildlife friendly habitat. Uh, and I'm wondering if that's something that could be um, pointed to as well that, you know, there's incentive to do it. It's not necessarily uh, that incentive co it essentially covers the cost of doing it. Um, and so we're going to make this a requirement within some limitations, but um any thoughts on that yeah absolutely I, I think that's a conversation you all can have um again about reasonableness and scope of of regulation if you know i leave it to you to make the policy decision but you know just to say you know what's what's the rationale behind wanting to pr protect these wildlife habitats and pollinator you know obviously we can say just from a layman's point of view like those things are good to have and we don't want to take them down. But, you know, we might want to say, you know, these wildlife habitats provide these benefits to the town or these benefits to the community and the pollinators provide this benefit to the general welfare. And, and that's why we're requiring, you know, removal and replacement or we're requiring such a percentage or, you know, whatever, whatever you all deem is reasonable. But yeah, certainly, I, I think this is something that falls in those, that category um, that you can make a you can make an argument for that that's a reasonable regulation. Okay, great. Um, and then um, I think to, to round this out, out with the, the solar ones is, yeah, so this, this concept where, you know, especially with the sensitivities, obviously, of cutting down forest, nobody likes to do that. Um, but uh, to the extent that, uh, you know, could a zoning uh, bylaw uh, provide that, under certain maybe a certain acreage amount of of forest that's um being removed that the developer demonstrate that they put into permanent permanent um um uh protection i guess uh, some permanent protection plan a, a, an equal or some amount of forest to sort of compensate for that loss um i think there's ways we can get to that end goal and, and that would that would be fine uh, again i would just say and, and this is i apologize just me not knowing you know how how it works practically but you know my 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 concern would be if we you know certainly we could say it's not uncommon to see bylaws even outside of solar that say well if you take down one acre you should you know one acre on this side of the property we're going to put up an acre on the other side or we're you're going to have some percentage of of revegetation or or something along that line on the property what i might might have a concern with and this is just me not knowing a whole lot about it is if you know we say oh we got to put you know we took down one acre and the town says so you got to put up one acre somewhere else you know land trust or something else and the the applicant might say well that's going to cost us 10 times as much as it would be if i planted them on the property or for or if i did this other mitigation um, again, I, I say that not to say that you can't do it. It's just, you know, it's going to depend on the specifics. So, so yeah, it, it's fine. Just, you know, you know, again, why, why, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Public health, safety, and welfare. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. I, I've said this presentation. So many, <laughs> I've said this so many times and my, my wife who is not a lawyer knows the standard. <laughs> 40A3. Um, she's, heard, she's heard me practice it a lot. <laughs> All right, good. Um, Chris, thank you. So um, Stephanie may know more about this, but I think our current wetlands bylaw, our town wetlands bylaw, allows for off-site mitigation of wetlands resource, you know, disturbance. And I think there's a financial component to it. In other words, if you can't mitigate on site or you don't have a piece of land that you can mitigate, then you can contribute to the town a certain amount of money. And again, Stephanie, she's got her hand up. Maybe she knows more about that. But I was just going to ask, is that a reasonable type of thing to do? In other words, if you take down 30 acres of trees, might you be ask to contribute to a fund to plant some acreage of trees in another location, but that money would temporarily go into a trust fund of some sort. Is there any 
anything that can be done like that? A, so I would say the short answer is yes. My longer answer is there's a lot of different factors that would go into something like that. Um, I would say first, just from a reasonable reasonableness perspective under the Zoning Act, we want to say, you know, what's the cost associated with replanting trees versus, you know, donating to the town? Um, you know, you might have an applicant who claims aggrievement because they can't afford the replacement and there's not enough space on the property. So that, that's a lot of different factors um, that would be considered uh, in the language of the bylaw. My second thought is from a municipal finance perspective is how do we treat that money? Who's responsible for managing the money? Who gets to say how it's spent? What is it spent on? Those are all questions that can be answered, but uh, it's hard, It's hard, um, or it's just something to consider is if we're gonna go down that road, um, we get out of the zoning realm and we get into finance realm and there's a whole lot of requirements with managing municipal funds. Um, so they can be answered, but folks might not like the answers. So something also to keep keep in consideration. Yeah, good. Yeah, Stephanie, you had something? Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that, um, so in my experience with the wetlands, the preference and the priority is always to mitigate on site as much as possible. That's the first thing you should always try to do is mitigate with on the parcel that you're impacting. Um, I think the financial piece has come in you know, later. I, it's been quite some time since I actually was the wetlands administrator. So I think that requirement is fairly new, but also I would say it doesn't sound like uh, just funds go to a general fund. It would have to be, toward, I think, towards um, mitigating for wetland impacts because we have a no net loss requirement both within the state and locally. So you would have to put it towards mitigating for the impacts to wetlands. So, um, or somehow um, creating buffer that would protect wetlands. So it would have to be, it couldn't be just general fund, this, you know, the, the money gets spent wherever. So um, that's just my response to that is all. Yeah, and I just had something to add on to that. So it is a fairly new requirement or option in the conservation plan. And during our last meeting, we reviewed sort of how we would calculate any sort of contribution for off-site mitigation. And to Stephanie's point, you know, it's always preferred to do that mitigation on site, but sometimes it's just not possible. Um, and all the funds, it's not like a general slush fund that goes directly to um, actual projects that the Conservation Commission would implement um, for those purposes. So it's an interesting idea to consider for the Solar Bylaw Working Group. Um, it's certainly been done in other communities. I mean, the idea was taken directly from other Massachusetts communities where it was in place, so. Um, and I would just, one last note on, on that is, um, there's a concern with these sorts of trust funds if it's the only option that it's an unconstitutional tax or it's an impermissible tax. Um, um, and so in the limited circumstances where they are enacted, we always give applicants other options. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the town is only allowed to tax uh, based on what the legislature gives them the power to tax. Uh, and so we we are sometimes concerned with those kinds of trust funds to say, well, you know, you only give me the option to pay this money. It's a it's essentially a tax. It's unconstitutional. And so the way we get around that, not get around that, but the way that we address that concern is we say, well, here's option A, here's option B, here's option C, and also you can pay this money if you choose to voluntarily. Um, so I think if that this starts becoming part of the conversation, just uh, I would recommend you know, coming up with a lot of options for an applicant, you know, put yourselves in the shoes of the applicant to say, you know, I have this project, these are, you know, this is what I'm trying to do. And what is the town going to require of me? You know, what choices do I have? Um, always something important to, to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Super. All right, great. Any other questions for Jonathan sort of on, on the solar side? We're going to, uh, there's a few questions with regard to, um, battery energy storage that we'll go to next. Great. Okay, so let's move on to the battery storage ones. And I, I think, as you indicated, 
earlier, Jonathan, there's a little bit some some additional uncertainty, I guess, in terms of this new <laughs> this new technology. Um, but um, um, I guess you know first uh, just outright size uh, limitations in a, in a bylaw uh, limit limiting the size of battery storage. Yeah, so I would, if you haven't had a chance to read the memo, uh, I talk about two areas of concern when we talk about this. The the thirty second version is that when the state uh, adopts statutes or regulations that control a field is kind of the term of art. Um, there, it preempts the municipality from regulating it. So the clear example is the building code. The building code is adopted by the state as a regulation, and the town can't adopt a zoning bylaw that says, well. Um, you know, this, the building code says you have to have these fixtures, you know, on your on your kitchen sink, but we say you need these other ones. The state says, no, we've wholly regulated the field of the building code. Um, you, towns can't regulate it, they're preempted. So that, uh, that idea of preemption when it comes to battery storage systems comes in two effects. One is the building code. Um, and I would, and I explain it more in detail, but there are current codes and codes that are coming down the pipeline that will regulate battery energy storage systems. So to the extent that the regulation pertaining to size conflicts with the building code or with other state codes, you may be restricted. The other thing is that the state regulates through what's called the um, energy, the energy facility siting board, which is a board uh, within the Department of Public Utilities. They regulate big um, utility installations, normally, you know, gas and, um, you know, coal, I don't think there's any coal, but um, it would include energy, you know, electricity generating facilities. Uh, and this might, might be under their jurisdiction. So to the extent that you have a size restriction, and it's also subject to regulation by the, the, the board, um, you may not be able to enforce that restriction, because the board is going to preempt local control. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third factor is, again, I said it earlier, but if it's associated with solar, you're going to have a restriction under the Zoning Act. So, so those are the three to consider if they're, you know, one, associated with solar, and then two, if they're subject to regulation by the state under a different scheme. Um, standalone battery energy storage, not associated with solar. Um, as far as we're aware right now, the case law says it's not entitled to that same protection. So I think you could have a size restriction. And again, um, I'm not I'm not trying to rush through these, but I think it's the same answer. Um, I'm just looking at it on my other screen here. Sorry. Um, so minimum setbacks uh, pertaining to buildings, pertaining to residences, um, constraints on visual impacts. Um, uh, yeah, you 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 could have those, but again, if they're regulated somewhere else, you might be limited. If they're associated with solar, they're definitely limited. Um, if they're standalone, just like any other zoning bylaw, you, you probably there's a good chance you could regulate it. Um, so it's going to really depend on where this regulation comes in. Great, and regulate them um, with ju with justification based on public health and safety and welfare still. Well, well, I would, yeah, I think generally that's, you know, that's the intent of the Zoning Act. We always want to keep that in there. I would say if it's a standalone system not associated with solar, there isn't as much of an emphasis. Right. right. Um, but still, those are always good things to have. <laughs> yep. um, but not, not as a strict. Right. Okay. Because they're not protected under the Dover Act, yeah, the Dover Amendment or whatever it was. Yep. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Um, and I suppose number five um, also kind of um, yeah, right. mm -hmm. it is the same answer. Uh, uh, DEP has a comprehensive set of noise, odor, and dust regulations. They're at 310 CMR. And um, um, to the extent that a zoning bylaw were to conflict with those regulations, I would have a preemption concern. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, a court might say, this isn't a matter for zoning. This is something the Board of Health should address through the, either the DEP regulations or Chapter 111, which they're allowed to, to uh, abate nuisances. Um, so the answer is possibly you could address noise, but just be aware that there are state regulations addressing noise already um, and that the Board of Health, depending on the, the circumstances and what the language is, may be the more appropriate board to address those concerns, but it's not, 
I wouldn't say there's an outright prohibition on it. Great. And maybe you can comment a little bit just as I'm thinking this through. Um, the battery, battery storage technology field is changing quickly, the technology, the chemi chemistries and so forth. Uh, and to the extent that, you know, we want as evergreen zoning bylaws as possible, you know, at least we don't want to hash them out again in, in the next couple of years and, you know, maybe think about 10 years at least or something um, where the, you know, battery technology can change a lot uh, between now and then. Um, you know, my sense is that we want these bylaws to be very, you know, based on sort of performance-based um, standards uh you know not not that they, they you can't you can't make noise but you have to certain decibels or whatever less than that as long as it's not preempted by dep um and uh and 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 and, and so forth even the visual impacts i mean the the uh it, it's if, if we base that on megawatt capacity of the storage who knows what you know a megawatt of storage is going to look like five years from now as opposed to now so can you maybe just talk address sort of how we go about writing these things so that that they are not you know based only on the uh, you know very specific on the technology that's at hand today yeah i think there's probably two two main approaches you could take to that the first being um some sort of reference to industry strengths industry standards or you know um uh, compliance with the building code or you know other state or or they're called international codes. That's the, the name of them. Um, so it's reference to other materials that perhaps are going to be updated more frequently than the town is going to update their zoning bylaw. That's one way to handle it. I think the second way to handle it is to say, uh, leaving it more broad and giving discretion to the board that is going to be overseeing um, applications of this. So to say, you know, noise shall be consistent. You know, I. I this is kind of, you know, you know, how do you craft the language, but, you know, gi giving that discretion to the board to say, you know, noise is, noise is a concern and the applicant shall make all attempts to the satisfaction of the board, um, that noise isn't an issue, um, and shall consider the following mitigation techniques, and you might say screening and buffering and all that kind of stuff, but leave the discretion of the board to say, well, here, here's what the bylaw, here's the framework that the bylaw gives us, and we think based on this particular application and the, the, the characteristics of the site and the mitigation proposed that it adequately addresses noise. And that way you're not getting into a, a conversation about, you know, the, the technical details, because to your point, you know, in 10 years from now, you know, there might be some advantage where you don't need screening or you don't need buffering. And, and a future board could say, well, we used to require, you know, big walls to screen the noise, but that's not required anymore because the technology has improved so much. We're not going to require that of you applicant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's the second way to do it. And, and there could be a combination of both of those techniques to say, you know, board, look towards these regulations as your as your standard, but also, you know, you de you determine based off of the particulars of the site whether what they've proposed is adequate because it might need more, it might need less, you know, they're the ones who are going to be considering the application. Thank you. Yeah, that's really helpful. All right. Um, I think we've gotten to the bottom of the list, which has been great. Um, and this has re been really helpful for us to to uh, really review with you, Jonathan, and, and sort of have the opportunity to ask follow up questions and clarifications and just run through this with you. Um, any um, I see Stephanie's hand up, but uh, just before we let Jonathan go, um, just think of any final questions or or thoughts for Jonathan, but we'll um, go to Stephanie first. Um, yeah, just a quick question. And um, Jonathan, I apologize if you've addressed this elsewhere, but um, when staff was initially discussing questions, um, one of the things that came up for us is what is the size of public? For instance, is that something the committee would decide is one a butter to a project quote unquote public how how do we address that yeah it's a tough question um to be honest because 
it, it might vary depending on what's being regulated and, 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 and by which source, you know, zoning bylaws or health regulations or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I would say one, the, the quote common sense approach. So um, we, you know, if a, if a third party if a judge of a different attorney is going to look at this and say, you know, the next door neighbor is probably not public, you know, just if we're just concerned with one next door neighbor, probably not public. Because public implies to me, just based off of the de definition, definition, excuse me, dictionary definition, um, more you know, more of a community, more people, more volume of people. So that's kind of just the, the basic approach. Um, I think the second approach, you know, when we're talking about you know what is public welfare or what is public safety, is is in this pol in this process that you all are undertaking you know, what evidence have you collected or what evidence can you go out and collect to say, um, you know, what is public health or public welfare? For example, this is, I, I'm just thinking of another community, but in another community, um, when they were doing their bylaw, they had different, they had really uh, uh, delineated water sources. You know, this side of town got it from this aquifer and this side of town got it from this. So you might define public health and saying, you know, the north side of town has a public health risk because of uh, this environmental factor or this um, erosion factor, or, um, you know, maybe it's even, you know, as it pertains to noise, this one might be a little far, far fetched. But just as an example, you might say, you know, the area around UMass or Amherst College is, is probably, because I was a student there, I remember how lo loud it got. It's noisy um, anymore. <laughs> right. It, it might not be as susceptible to noise, but maybe South Amherst, where, um, you know, there's less density and all that kind of stuff, is more susceptible. So for that public area, uh, you know, it's going to depend on what, what you're trying to regulate. Um, again, I, I, I wish I could give you a definition and something like that, but um, it's going to be based off of one, that common sense approach of does this sound right? You know, if you were trying to convince someone else, you know, what is public welfare? Or what is public health? Um, you know, does it pass the smell test, if you will, if I can use the not artful phrase? And then the second approach is, you know, how, what are we trying to regulate and, and what's the, how is it going to protect? What's the, what's the group of citizens or the community that's going to protect? I think I got a question at the ZBA, um, or maybe it was a different conversation about, well, isn't the public welfare, um, you know, as it pertains to solar energy and, and the climate crisis and all that kind of stuff, isn't it the whole world or isn't it the whole country or the whole state? You know, you really could define it quite broadly. I would say to that, yeah, from a policy perspective, it's not necessarily wrong. From a legal perspective, the judge is going to say, well, Amherst has the power to regulate things in Amherst. It doesn't have the power to regulate things in Boston and, and Provincetown and um, you know, Texas and California and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I would just keep that guardrail in your mind to say, yeah, it, it might have a benefit to the, the, the world, the country, the state at large, but your focus is, is um, your general welfare and your public health and your public safety. Just along those lines, and just while we have you, and, and um, this issue of aesthetics, uh, I think will will come up in our conversations. And and uh, you know, obviously, and I think uh, it may, may may have been Jan or somebody sort of wrote some comments with regard to, um, you know, I mean, one reason why we love Amherst is uh, is the aesthetic beauty that we all enjoy and, and share um, in 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 the town. Um, uh, uh, but um, you know, and, and I, I would categorize that under general welfare, uh, but um, it's 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 pretty subjective, or or it could be viewed as quite subjective, of what people think is aesthetic, um, and um, um, so and so how how strong can that argument be in terms of uh, you know protecting, for example, protecting specific view sheds. Um, uh, in, in, in a, in a bylaw? Well, I think certainly if there are, um, concrete concerns when we're talking about aesthetics or, or, or visual design, um, that might have a detrimental impact on either the community or neighbors or, or what, what it may be. So for example, you know, 
glare is often brought up in these conversations. You know, the 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 pitch of the the panels and the slope and which way they're oriented. And you might say, from an aesthetic aesthetic point, um, you know, we want you to design the system so as to minimize glare, and that might be you know, screening it or putting up vegetation buffer or something like that. So from an aesthetic point, you can tie in those concerns um, in association with detriments to public health, safety and welfare. Um, if it's just, you know, I want it, I want the color of the wall red and not blue, that's not gonna fly. <laughs> um, uh, that it's it's beyond, you know, that's, that's more of a, a, a preference and it's harder to justify. Certainly, certainly there are designs, you know, you go into certain towns that say, you know, all the signs shall be this particular color. And you, you see a Dunkin' Donuts with a green sign, and you say, well, what's going on there? <laughs> um, that's kind of a different conversation, more about district planning and, and that kind of stuff, not, not this use planning. Uh, but I would say giving, giving options or, or, or incorporating aesthetic options into the design um, you know, to say, you know, you know, it's important, you know, that it's it's important to screen these, or you know, provide a visually appealing options and ways an applicant might do that is provide vegetative cover, provide, you know, screening, screening, fence screening or wall screening that's consistent with the the to, the topography and the natural habitat of the site. Um, you know. There's, I think, a few different ways from a planning perspective you might be able to achieve that. Um, again, we're, we're talking about reasonableness. So if you, can, if you can connect it to public health, safety, and welfare, awesome. Uh, if it's just a matter of preference, you might not have that authority. Yeah. Good. Yeah, good. Uh, Chris. So in other words, um, if you have, you know, we have some pretty fantastic view sheds. We have view sheds all along Northeast Street and Southeast Street and other parts of town. So we wouldn't really be able to say, well, you can't put solar arrays in those locations because they are, are magnificent view sheds. You could um, say that there would be um, requirements for screening to the extent possible, but it may not be possible to actually screen these things completely from site, from the road. And so, you know, it would be a question of giving the applicant a reasonable um, form of mitigation that he could use or a reasonable form of trying to minimize the view of the solar arrays, but you couldn't say, no, you can't put it there because that's our lovely view shed. Is, am I um, understanding you correctly? Yeah, you are. Um, and, and this might be a little inside baseball, but it, uh, under the Zoning Act, we talk, there's a list of things that someone might be aggrieved by either a local decision or a bylaw or something like that. There's categories and that could be, you know, um, a whole bunch of different things. But one thing that the court has kind of consistently said is visual impacts are generally not of interest protected by the Zoning Act. So when we're talking about visual um, impacts or regulations to visuals, um, I, I tend to be you know, we have to be a little more regulated in how we address those because um, there's not as much authority to say, uh, you know, um, you know, open space or, or, you know, utilities or, you know, erosion and all those kind of other things that are, are protected. But yeah, yeah, Chris, you're, you're right. I would say, you know, if you said, if you started banning, and that goes back to Tracer Lane, um, when I was clerking at the land court, I wrote two, case, two cases. One was called PLH versus East Longmeadow, and one was called PLH versus uh, Ware, um, same company. They did the same thing. Um, that was one of the conversations, too, where they were wholesale banning from particular areas of town. And the judge in that case said, no, no, you can't wholesale ban. You know, you might have a reason for it, but you can't wholesale ban. What you might be able to do is say, you know, um, you know, it's allowed in this area of town, but because of the, the factors, you know, your your views or whatnot, we want this particular type of vegetative screening, or we want we want this type of fencing, or or something like that. Great. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, um, and uh, really appreciate your your um, 
candor and your your knowledge and insight. Uh, and um, I know you'll be with us along the way to some extent if we have uh, any uh, quicker follow-up questions, I guess, along the way. And then obviously, I, I presume you sort of review these at the when they finally get to that, that position. So uh, hopefully you'll see a, some drafts and then final versions that really reflect uh, all that we learned from you uh, through this process. Um, good luck. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And I'm, you know, I, uh, if you have any questions, please just let me know. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Good. All right. Great. Um, welcome back, everybody. <laughs> that was really insightful and, and helpful. I'm glad we, we ran through those. It's really just helpful to hear them talk them out in addition to the written responses. Um, great. Um, anything before we on that, just after Jonathan left, before we, we move forward? with uh, returning to the top of the agenda, probably. Great, okay, so let's, um, we, 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 we have about 20 minutes left, so not a whole lot of time. So let's do what we need to get done, particularly um, with the uh, reviewing and voting on the minutes from uh, two weeks ago. Um, I think some quick staff updates and then um, uh, time permitting, which I hope we do have, I wouldn't mind uh, just um, particularly focusing on the, um, uh Amherst Water Supply Protection Committee uh final now report to us which was greatly appreciated and maybe Jack can just uh walk us through that uh quickly or or address how they sort of finalize that document um okay so uh first with the minutes um from November 18th meeting um have people had time to review those and assuming so anybody have any um concerns or, or revisions to offer or ask seeing none um and let me just uh verify you up so that was um that was jack yeah thank you jack for for taking those minutes um um any um yeah, is that a question? Well, <laughs> I won't move to approve them, but uh, since I okay. wrote them, but I... <laughs> oh, I think I, I don't think you're prohibited from uh, suggesting uh, suggesting that. So, uh, assuming he's not prohibited from making oh, a motion, I was trying to make Stephanie a co-author, but she took her name off. But... <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So I think Jack was that a motion to uh, accept the minutes. Yeah, I guess if that's permissible. Yep. Yep. Okay, great. Any um anybody uh care to second that motion? Oh, okay. Okay. We'll go with Laura who uh, beeped in first. Doot, yes. Doot, doot. <laughs> um all right. Um okay, great. So um so voice vote? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay, so no particular order. Um Brooks? Yes. Breger? Yes. Jemsek? Yes. Corcoran? Yes. Hanner? Yes. Pagliarulo? Yes. Okay. okay. Minutes are approved. Okay. And then, um, yeah, maybe uh, any quick, well, maybe quick uh, staff updates for us um, from uh, uh, Stephanie and then Chris. Sure. Very quickly, um, we had a department head meeting last week with um, Adrian to uh, review some um, general questions, survey questions for department heads. Um, great meeting. We had at least, I think, 17 of us were there um, in attendance. Uh, next steps will be to um, develop a, a public survey questionnaire, and that will certainly be distributed to both the ECAC, your group, and department heads for um, feedback before it goes out to the general public. Um, also, I want to make a general statement about the assessment just again for clarification, that when the assessment is completed and the map is provided, what is indicated on the map does not identify where solar will go. It only identifies the potential feasibility. If a site shows that it's potentially feasible or doesn't show that it's feasible, it doesn't mean it is or isn't. It's going to require um, additional ground um, 
review, you know, and analysis before any solar installation could go even on a parcel that's identified as potentially being feasible. So there's other levels of review prior to um, installing solar. It will have to go through environmental permitting if it's necessary. And um, so I just want to be clear that it's, this is not identifying where it will go. It's only the potential feasibility for development of solar. And it's just a place to start. Great, thank you. Um, Chris, anything? I, I know uh, you've been obviously under the weather, so um, um, don't worry. I don't have anything. I've basically been out sick for the last week, um, trying to keep up with, with what I can, but I don't have anything new. Thank you. All right, great. Okay. Uh, good. So that um, gives us uh, maybe five five minutes or so, because I do want to get to uh, public comments as well uh, before the one thirty. And so, uh, Jack, just on on behalf of myself and and the working group, I did just want to express our um, appreciation and thanks to the um, Water Supply Protection Committee uh, for uh, uh, working on this report, developing this report, uh, addressing the comments that we provided and others have provided. And, and then finalizing that um, as suggested in the cover letter. Um, absolutely, I think this is gonna be a great uh, resource um, and reference material for this working group to work from, um, you know, particularly as it pertains to the zoning around, around the, particularly our water supply area. So uh, just thank you for, for, uh, for all that work. Um, and uh, if you could express that appreciation to the committee as well, that would be super. Um, did you want to um, thank you? Make any comments or uh, um, review? Well, it sounds like we should move this to the next meeting just to kind of go through it. I, I you know, mm -hmm. I, I guess I would refer to the red line strikeout version, which may or may not be super accurate, but it gives me. Or I could go through the questions that the the that the this working group had. Either way, uh, kind of you know say what was updated to it. So, and then I think there was reference to. Um, um, uh, Aaron Jock's uh, comments as well, so yeah. I can you know talk briefly about those. Great. Well, let me uh, let me first just um, you mentioned a I, I I'm not sure if I saw a red strikeout version. Right. Okay. Uh, Stephanie's mm -hmm. acknowledging something. Yeah. Okay. No, we're right. only only reviewing the final product that was submitted to the group, not previous drafts. Only the final product, and then there were three additional items um, that were submitted. One was the combined list of questions, which actually seems like a logical thing for you all to review. And then Erin Jock's comments um, that were provided both for the draft and also her uh, sources that she cited. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, and I think there are some comments with regard to her comments were well intentioned, but, not, not, but to some extent broader than the issue of, of water supply. Um, that, that was the scope, yes. scope of the work. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, I guess I would be, um, um, as this sort of arrived in our packet uh, just a day or so ago, um, if uh, sort of open the open the floor for any clarifying questions or or, or questions to tee up for Jack, uh, but otherwise uh, spend some time on this as an agenda item for our next meeting. Um, and people can be be better prepared. And maybe Jack, if you could sort of think about you know ten minutes just to review uh, the the uh, the report and our, sort of some key takeaways, and maybe also how you specifically address some of the more interesting questions that, uh, or comments and questions that you received. Sure, that'd be good. Great. Okay, so we'll put that on the agenda for next time. Um, and uh, but any uh, just questions for Jack to help think about what we might cover next time on this. Great, okay. Um, all right, so let, let's, let um, before we go to public comment, uh, just to be all on board with our next meeting, uh, it's gonna be st uh, another one two weeks from today, which brings us to the 16th of December. Uh, we'll stick with the 1130. Um, I apologize for that, Martha. I know you're going to be on the West Coast okay. again, an, an early, early meeting. Uh, but I, 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 I think it's my last department meeting that starts at 1.30. So um, um, I, I'd appreciate starting at 11.30, um, at least for the next meeting. Um, 
we can discuss it at the next meeting, but my sense is that we will skip the 30th of uh, December. Uh, I'm not exactly sure where I'll be <laughs> or what I'll be up to, uh, but um, I think a lot of us will probably be in holiday mode. Um, so is that is that sound okay with folks? And then we'll pick it up in um, what would might be January uh, 13th, though we could go with the 6th um, to get us going again. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. So let's think about January 6th as the next one. Um, but uh, we'll we'll confirm that on um, uh, on during our meeting on the 16th. Okay. Great. Um, Stephanie, if you could um, open it up to any public thoughts or comments that might be um, looking to, to to provide some comments. Sure, Steve Roof. All righty. You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hello there. Um, th thank you for your work. This is Steve Roof, uh, Amherst resident in, on uh, Southeast Street. And I had a question that would... Um, would have loved to be able to ask Jonathan when he was speaking. And it has to do with those first two questions, kind of about the making the case for forest protection. And this is this is my question that you guys might want to consider. And that's if a solar bylaw makes the case for restricting solar development to preserve forests for public health, safety, and welfare, but town zoning allows other forms of development that impacts forests, would, would that undermine the validity of a forest protection restriction specific to solar development? So in other words, how, how would a judge or court look at the consistency across the town zoning to see if restrictions on solar were very different than mm -hmm. other activities, not solar? That would be an interesting question, I think, to to get an answer on. So, I mean, particularly maybe Steve, with the fact that solar is provided protection under the Dover Amendment, whereas other forms, um, housing, for example, or a house, single family or multiple family house, may not. Um, good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank. Thank you, Steve. Um, Stephanie, I mean, do you think that could be a, a just a one-off question we asked Jonathan to opine on? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Um, awesome. All right. Anyone else have uh, from the public want to make a comment or ask a question of the committee? Please electronically raise your hand. All right, see, seeing none, um, I'm happy to get five min minutes to grab something to oh, from my department yeah, I, meeting. I just I wanted to say there were five panelists. I know the question's coming up. So okay. I'm a five attendees. That was the maximum for the meeting. But uh, yeah, exactly. And uh, go ahead, Martha. Just quickly say on our, our last minutes say that we were going to invite the fire department to come to our next meeting to make a presentation. Is that still the plan? Well, maybe we can invite them and see when and if they're available, uh, willing, available, either at December 6th or January, sorry, December 16th or January 6th. I'll reach out Yeah, find and, out and, which date works. Yeah, yeah. And basically get, uh, um, and they, they actually made some comments to the uh, Water Supply Committee group. Um, so I got a sort of sense of where they're at, but it would be great to hear what their um level of of uh, knowledges and capabilities <clears throat> and uncertainties as well yeah thank you martha for reminding us on that mm -hmm. okay very good um appreciate everybody uh hard hard uh, work today and attention um and um i hereby declare this meeting adjourned <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Have a good rest of the day. Well, thank you. Thanks, Jane.